room, relatives. <laughs> but it cleared up a bit for us. So I want to thank you for coming. As you know, tonight is a twofer. Two for the price of one. We're going to talk about the viaduct and then talk about the stones and lumber, nearby stones and lumber. So, going to dive right in. The uh, viaduct was completed in October 1940. In the next couple of days, they closed Main Street, they closed Water Street, they closed Elm Street. That's the end of the story. But let's briefly go back to the beginning of the story and found out, find out how we got into this predicament in the first place. So, let us begin. Just like this. Here it is, it's eight, the 1850s. America is building its railroad system. Much like it built the interstate system in the 1950s and 1960s. The difference was that it was being paid for by private companies. Every space between these red dots is a different railroad company, and they were raising their own capital. But they were under the uh, control of the railroad commissioners in Hartford, and their job was to promote the orderly growth of railroads. And they reported directly to the state legislature where all the power was at the time. Not in the federal government, it was not in the government, it was in the state legislatures. And the railroad commissioners reported directly to the state legislature. And as you can see, in the Boston, New York group, they said, yeah, that's us. <laughs> they have all the rest of the track is there, and they're having a devil of a time completing this gap. And they're under tremendous pressure. Uh, the post office says, come on, get the thing done for heaven's sake, we can use it. For both mail, people in Boston wanted to complete, people in New York wanted to complete, but they kept running across problems. For example, the railroad commissioners uh, sanctioned the, a company called the New London and Stonington Railroad. And they said to them, build us a railroad. Build it quickly, build it straight. And do we mention quickly? <laughs> and three years later, they hadn't done a blessed thing. They were had internal problems, money problems. So the railroad commissioners took the unusual step of revoking their charter because they're under pressure, national pressure and otherwise. And they said to the neighboring railroad, the New Haven and New London, you are now the New Haven, New London, and Stonington Railroad. They're a powerful group that they can do that. But they did and they told them, complete this railroad, complete it quickly, complete it straight, and do we mention quickly. <laughs> and so they went, they spent the year uh, surveying the land from here to the Thames River, 12 miles, figuring out where the tracks are going to go, where the depots are going to go. In 1857, they came into the borough, and they, they told us what they're going to do. They said, we're going to, over on east of the borough, we're going to hook up with the current line over here. This is the Stonington line, the, the western end of the Stonington line, which went up to Providence. So this new railroad is going to hook up here, and then they said they're going straight to the straight over Elm, Main, and Water. And when we get to the harbor, we're going straight across the harbor. Well, you couldn't have caused a bigger stir if you dropped the bomb on the borough. In particular, the, uh, the warden and Burgesses were absolutely livid. They didn't like what they were doing. They didn't like the way they were doing it. And so the warden and Burgesses fired off this nasty letter to the the legislature saying, where is the New Haven and London story? Crossing all three streets in a dangerous manner without consulting us. They're invading the rights of the said citizens. And they sent this angry letter to the state legislature. <coughs> the state legislature said, okay, we'll have hearings. Come on up. State your case. So the hearing is going to be in August of 1857. Now bear in mind, the warden and Burgesses are asking the state legislature to stop the railroad from doing what the state legislature asked the railroad to do. <laughs> this is going to be a tough sell. <laughs> not surprisingly, we did not get a sympathetic hearing. They said, uh, do you have an alternative? There was no alternative. They said, uh, everyone agreed the new railroad had to come to the borough because this was the most important port around. The steamers came in here. The uh, freight steamers and the passenger steamers, so the railroad had to be in the borough, that was a given. And of course, they had to connect with the existing line, that's also a given. 
So, the legislature said, request denied. And there was a second request we had. You really got to block off the harbor. Look at all this up here. You never get there again with this uh, railroad causeway. And their answer was, that's shallow. There's nothing going on there. We're not bothering any commerce. The railroad did what it was supposed to do, which is to find a narrow spot on the harbor and go across. And all the commercial traffic is south. The railroad did the right thing. People wanted them to go around the water, around these inlets. And their argument was, we're building a national railroad here for the ages. You can't be going around every inlet, every waterway, and end up with some sort of loop-de-loop -loop railroad. We need speed. Every locomotive is going faster and faster. We need straightaways. They did the right thing. Request to change the track. D9. <coughs> then we had one last desperate wish. This was spearheaded by a couple of captains around here. Um, Nathaniel and Alex Palmer. They lived on North Water Street. And they the suspicion was that they wanted to bring their private boats up here where Don's dock is. So that was the reason, one, they were against the track down there. And two, they requested that they make this a drawbridge. The legislature said, you've got to be kidding me. A drawbridge, there's nothing going on up there. They said, we need a drawbridge over in Mystic. No one doubts that. But there's no need for a drawbridge here. They're expensive to build, and they have to be maintained by a person, a man by a person all the time. No robbery. So as you see, we got totally shut out on this little venture up to Harvard. And so the railroad had us a car launch to go ahead and build this 12 miles of railroad from here over to the Thames River. And this is what it looked like. Right down here, this line here. By the way, only the railroad really called out a straight line. <laughs> So initially, they, um, they manned in like from 
7 a.m. to 10 a.m. <coughs> Excuse me. And then in the afternoon, because I'm losing my voice. Is there water in there? Now, I'm harping on this incident because, in my opinion, 
More than any other single incident, this is why we have fire. These were not two strangers, they were not two tourists, they were two beloved members of the community. It's a second marriage for both. He widowed, she, she divorced. They've been married for seven years. Before that, she had been the visiting nurse, a popular visiting nurse, an angel of mercy. And he had worked down here at Atlas for 25 years, saved his pennies, and at the same time he got married, he bought a hardware store right here at 72 Water Street. Very, very sad time in the borough. And they had a double funeral. There's a Davis funeral home right here on Water Street near Harmony. And uh, as the person left the funeral home, they were side by side, equals in life, equals in death. And they went side by side through the village over to the Congregational Church, which is packed. Every store in the borough is closed so the people could go for their fellow merchant, they had the ceremonies, and when they left, again, they're side by side to the Stonington Cemetery. It's not an exaggeration to say that this accident traumatized the community. And when it was done, people thought, okay, what are our options? What can we do? We cannot continue playing Russian roulette with these three crossings. And this is when the railroad gets in the picture. Railroads hate crossings, and they're always looking for a way to close them down. Now, it took a while. In fact, it took three years. But the railroad came and said, we have a solution for you. It's called a viaduct. The first question is, what is a viaduct? Railroads said, don't overcomplicate it. It's simply an arched bridge with more than one section. Ours has eight. And, uh, so they listed a whole bunch of places where the viaduct might go. In the sweetener, a federal program came along at this very time called the Federal Aid Project. And uh, this federal aid project said to all the states, list all the dangerous conditions roads you have in your state in order, and we'll, we'll start on them and work right down. And we in Connecticut were number two on that list. Number one was the place over in Derby. That must have been a big death traffic to beat us out. But anyway, we're going we're to get some federal money. And the federal feds are going to pay for the bridge, but the railroad and the town have to pay for any houses that have to be taken, for any land that has to be taken. And that's what the railroad did. They were not priced out how much it would cost to take the land and the houses. Don't forget, these are Depression-era prices. And uh, it's no use to be going to all these, over all these because I didn't like any of them. But I'll give you a sampling of what they want. One was uh, go straight down Water Street, up and over. Another one straight down Main Street. Third one straight down Elm Street. Another one was uh, to go down Main Street by uh, and take a right where the uh, the Catholic Rectory is. Take that house down. There was nothing behind us but a couple of barns and go across that way. And uh, several others centered around the, the corner of, um, of uh, Main and Broad Street, where the Catholic Church is. One of them was a 45 degrees deep down that building. They go 45 degrees off and it would em empty into the Waterline Square. So the point is, they had a lot to chew on. But they were loath to take anybody's land. That was the problem. We, we got a problem. Somebody's willing to pay for it, but we don't like the solution. And so that's why they're going to talk about it forever. This is in 1932. That takes me to 1934. The discussions are still, actually, they're just getting going, believe it or not. Uh, Jack Gordon lived up in Winthrop, going to take a trip to New Mexico and back by himself. On his way back, he buys himself a brand new 34 Nash. He's coming down, he's, he's in Stonington, he's almost home, in her past, and he's going down Water Street. Like this. He had the tracks. And he walked the tracks. No way for this to go up. I'm coming. Ahead of him, he sees the gates come down to secure see my eyes. But he doesn't care about that because he's not going that way. Route 1 takes a left on Cutler Street. 
So he's not going to worry about that gate. So he turns his Nash, beautiful Nash. He turns to the left. The car turns 90 degrees, but keeps going straight because he is on ice. <laughs> he crashes through the gates over here, and he comes to stop right on the tracks facing east. He's also facing an oncoming locomotive. It's going about 50 miles an hour. It's nighttime. The whistle is blaring. That big white light will be shining out. This is the stuff of nightmares. He opens the door and he dies from the car just as the locomotive hits the uh, Nash. And there is Jack Gordon laying on the ground, unscathed. Not a scratch on him. Another close call at the Water Street crossing. Now, I mentioned this. Uh, the locomotive then took that formerly beautiful Nash and ran, uses a bat and ran against the, the gate housing and against the, uh, the shed. The uh, gate tender shed. By the way, where is the gate tender? Well, what's his name? Turns out it's the same guy, Billy Rittenhouse, who had been on duty the night that big cattle I just told you about. And he, he had learned his lesson. You don't sit and watch the show. You remove yourself from harm's way. <laughs> <laughs> so he was out of the way by the time uh, events hit the fan, so to speak. <laughs> but I mention this because as the discussions are going on, there was a significant minority of people who were not yet convinced we needed a viaduct, including this Stonington Mirror. They kept saying, we don't need no stinking viaduct. We just need people to drive more carefully. Well, Jack Gordon did everything right. And he almost bought the farm. So this incident, I bring this up because it changed minds. Now I'm going to talk about group one, which they changed right about the discussion the girl are taking place. Here we are in group one. Hopefully no one will be recognized as a here we are in front of the Shell Station on Route 1. From, if it was before October 1939, you would be looking at a stone wall right here. Route 1 took a right hand turn. This is it up here. Route 1, this is Route 1. It goes down into the borough, down toward the borough, I should say. Down to Color, over Color, and then out Elm Street. That, that was room one. And behind that wall was this big estate, this 86 acre estate, which had passed from one rich guy to another to another since the Civil War. But in 1911, it was purchased by three women, two of them sisters, and they're going to run an inn, which will become world famous, the Stonington Manor Inn. They asked the fourth woman to join them. They put it in a golf course, and they catered to the rich from Boston and New York. And one of the reasons it was so famous is how easy you could get here. You simply took the train to the Stonington Station up here, just off camera, and there was always a cabbie right waiting for you. Just take a short ride up, up North Water Street, along this path, and right over here, just out inside the woods, there was the Stonington Manor Inn. First floor, there's lots of banquet rooms and a nice library. Now, I want to tell you a story that ends up back here at the Stonington Museum. It's 1918. As part of the war effort, they started building big ships right over here in Town Dock. And these are two ships being constructed right now. These are big boats. And they're wooden and they're steam powered. And uh, you can tell wartime security is in effect because they have the places walled off. And one of the, then the war ends, and one of the ships had not been completed. And so here we are, May 20th, 1919, and we're going to launch the Lansing. The work, the work crews are working on the boat two hours before the uh, anointed hour. And uh, they're loosening the stays, and there's divers on the back of the boat and in the water. This boat is longer than the football field, so these are big boats. And then the supervisor notices 
that the boat had moved six inches. He immediately recognized the import of this and he started screaming, she's moving, she's moving, get out of the way, pass it on. And actually, if you're one end, they wouldn't hear you at the other end, because it's almost a football field. So the workers started scattering and the boat kept going, sliding down the waves. <laughs> So here it is in Stonington Harbor. This lighthouse up there used to be on Mount Bossick Breakwater. So they have improvised uh, ceremonies uh, when the invited guests get there. And then they all adjourn back to the Stonington Manor Inn. And they have a nice dinner. And there's a lot of loose banter about the ship that launched itself. And then they uh, had their picture. So, the 20s were very good for the Stonies and Manor Inn, not so the 30s. 1937, the four women locked the door, walked away, and moved down here, right across the street, to Cannon Square. At that point, the fate of the inn is um, unknown, but bleak. What followed is uh, the spring of 38. By the way, all this time, discussions are going on in the borough about where is going to buy it. And the statement in, no one saw this coming. This is a total surprise. Spring of 38, they come in and says, we're changing Route 1. This going down to the borough and back out is no good. We're going to start where the Route 1 meets North Water Street. And we're going to go over to Maine, over to Elm, where Oxacasa Brook is. And that's going to be the new Route 1. Believe it or not, people in the borough fought that. They didn't want that because to them, that meant a loss of money. When it came down close to the borough along Cutler Street, there was an A&P, there was a Booster Brothers gas station, there was a, another repair garage at a Deli Grain, and it was, it was retail business, and that's where they got money, and now they're going to lose it if they uh, change group one. But then the next, where am I? The next big thing happened was that infamous day here in the Burr, in the New England, September 21st, 1938, the Great Hurricane, where between six and seven hundred lives were lost, and uh, Stonington Manor Inn was demolished beyond repair. And, and so now, this is no longer going to be Route 1, and it could have derailed the discussions which have been going on for seven years about the Bible, but they did not, because people are starting to get, a consensus is starting to form. A lot of people like the idea of using the land between water and Maine as the Babcock estate, because one, it was already on the market, two, there were no houses on it, so they wouldn't be taking anybody's residence residence. And plus, if you put something in there that stops any other development which you may not like. So there was a favor. They wanted to use this property, but they didn't know exactly how. And they're working on it, and they come up with this line. They say, you know, if we draw this across like this, we can make it so we only lose one house. That would be underneath the borough. be a John Curtin's house. And we could even save uh, the garage over on over on Cutler Street, as you can see, it's a close call, but they did say that so consensus is developing around this group. At long last, talking about 1939. 1939, the, the uh, town council approves unanimously the, uh, the building of a viaduct to do it, and here it is completed in uh, 1940. Initially, I told you the cost of taking the land was going to be borne by the railroad and the town. Well, they, our town officials are pretty sharp, and they finessed that. So in the end, the town paid zero. And uh, the, the railroad ended up paying for the house on Main Street, and also when they put the Avenue, the they had to take uh, Fred Adams house up here on Allen Street. So they had to take two houses. We ended up with uh, the configuration that we have today. 
Feds pay for it. Now I must say, I won't say it's a happiness. I would describe the mood as one of resignation. We have a problem, we have a solution, someone else is going to pay for it. There are some advantages to Avida. For example, the trains going through were required to toot their whistle four times at every crossing. So that's 12 times. It's pretty noisy. And there were a lot more trains then than there are now. Because our nation's freight needs moved by rail. Today, they moved by a tractor trailer because we have an interstate system. So the point is, it's going to be a lot, lot quieter. And there's also the convenience factor. As you're about to leave the borough, the gates come down, and you look to your left, and there's the longest freight train you ever saw. <laughs> that must go to missing. You're going to sit there and cool your heels for 20 minutes. That goes away with the viaduct. So, we have a viaduct, and this right here is the crossover at Elm Street. Now, putting a crossover at Elm Street was uh, an easy call. It was general agreement that it was needed there because the borough, right here where we're leaving, living tonight, was a working class community and there were a lot of people that lived here that worked over at the Belvin Mill. And they walked to work, so they needed a crossover. And over by the Belvin Mill, there was uh, lots of houses, they called it the Bayview District, with kids. And those kids had to go over this to get to the borough school, which is over on this side. So there was a clear need for a crosswalk at Elm Street. They also tried to get one on Water Street. They fought, they wanted it, railroad fought it, railroad won. No crossover at Water Street, but there is one at Elm Street. So now let's go look at this viaduct that finally gets built. Not from the air, not from the car, but from the rail. After all, that's why it's there. No rail, no viaduct. Signal 135.8. This is from the 1950s. 
um, the big pole is gone, but the train still stops here. It stopped here until 1975. <coughs> the freight line is still in there. So it's over here, right in front of uh, what is now the Dog Watch Cafe. And this is the freight depot. They bring things in like car loads of lumber for Stonington lumber. But for these last two slides of the Vida portion, I want to take a different tack if you don't mind. I want to talk about this house right here. This is where the fire department is today, firehouse is today. And there was a family that lived in there, name of Glover. And then they had two daughters, one of them was named Winifred. And then this Italian fellow, come up for This Italian fellow was my good friend and yours, Morris McGraw. When he introduced Morris to her father, went into the bedroom to get ready for their date, she comes out. No dad, no Morris. What is going on? Morris realized early on that the way to this girl's heart is through her father, who she adored. So Morris took the father over to Grand Street, where there was a bar, <laughs> bought him a beer, and that was the ritual for every day. Go over for one drink. And then one day the father said to Winnie, you know, Winnie, you want to hook up with this fellow Maury? That would be all right with me. And that was the highest possible praise you could get. And uh, I hope you will join with me in once again thanking our benefactors for this beautiful building, Morris and Winnie Madrua. Yeah.